Hi, good afternoon, everybody. I am Bonnie Bestie with First Book, and I am really excited to welcome everyone um, and thank you for joining us this afternoon to learn more about how to reframe moments of frustration into skill building opportunities for young kids. I want to first share just a few couple quick housekeeping details. Um, firstly, we are going to respond to as many questions as we are able to at the conclusion of the presentation. So please enter your questions in the box that you see on your screen for Q&A um, at the section below. Um, secondly, this webinar is being recorded and it'll be made available on the First Book website as well as via email to share with anyone who may have been unable to attend. So we encourage you to share it with friends and colleagues who may not have been able to join. First Book is thrilled to be launching this initiative with Ellen Galinsky and Aaron Ramsey and the whole Mind in the Making team to leverage the research of using autonomy supportive approaches to help turning, turn challenging moments into opportunities that will reinforce important life skills. To provide a proper introduction, I would like to introduce Kyle Zimmer, First Book's co-founder and CEO, to share a little bit more about our longstanding partnership with Ellen Galinsky and the Mind in the Making team. Thanks, Bonnie, and welcome, everybody. We're here today to talk about an issue that has challenged educators, parents, and caregivers since, since really forever. So how can we best respond to behavioral issues exhibited by our children? Because it's common for kids to act out in response to the stimuli that they're facing, and it's especially true for kids who are under stress. So these behavioral challenges have been magnified during the pandemic, and they're further amplified by poverty and all those related issues. So what are the cutting edge research-based strategies for dealing with these behaviors? Well, fasten your seatbelt because today you are going to hear from field leading experts, Ellen Galinsky and Aaron Ramsey, who are recognized and extraordinary leaders and have also provided critical guidance to First Book for decades. Ellen Galinsky is the Chief Science Officer at the Bezos Family Foundation and the Executive Director of Mind in the Making. She is the author of more than 100 books and reports, including the groundbreaking book, Mind in the Making, The Seven Essential Life Skills Every Child Needs. It's not at all an overstatement to say that Ellen has changed the way that millions of children have grown up in America and around the world, and that means her impact will continue to be felt for generations. And we are all grateful for that. Joining Ellen is Erin Ramsey. She's Senior Manager for Mind in the Making at the Bezos Family Foundation and also an extraordinary leader. Now, before we dive into our program, I want to provide a quick flyover of my organization for those of you who might not be familiar with First Book. First Book is a nonprofit social enterprise, and we're dedicated to furthering educational equity for children in need ages zero to 18. At the heart of our work is the First Book Network, a growing online community that now includes more than half a million formal and informal educators serving children in need in every imaginable setting. Title I and Title I eligible schools, but also libraries and homeless shelters and soup kitchens, basically and anywhere and everywhere that kids in need gather. This is an unprecedented community. And to serve this group on uh, this group online, we've built three major components. The first is our research arm. It's called First Book Research and Insights that we use to gather qualitative and quantitative data from our network to learn what they need to remove barriers to education for the kids they serve. In addition to using these results to refine our own work, increasingly input from our educators is also being used to provide insights for curriculum development, governmental policies, corporate product designs, and a lot more. 
Second is our nonprofit e-commerce site, the first book marketplace, which so far has provided over 200 million brand new books and educational resources for free or at very low cost to our members. These books are of fantastic quality and they celebrate diversity. So they enable children to see themselves, their cultures, their families, and their experiences in the pages of books. The average cost of a book on our site runs about 380 and that includes shipping. The marketplace also carries other critical resources like hygiene products, school supplies, STEM kits, educational games, and lots more. And finally, our third initiative is the First Book Accelerator, which expedites evidence-based strategies from leading experts to address issues that are identified by our community, such as social and emotional learning, cultural diversity, and trauma. First Book works with experts to create actionable resources, such as free downloadable toolkits, videos, webinars, and other resources. And as a result, our educators gain access to these experts in months, not decades. Now, one person who certainly understands how all of our components fit together to elevate the field of educators serving kids in need is Ellen Galinsky. In fact, we call Ellen the godmother of our first book accelerator because she was the very first expert who worked with us to bring the powerful insights of her book, Mind in the Making, to the first book community. So today we're continuing this wonderful partnership with a focus on practical new tools and strategies to help us in to help us turn children's behavioral challenges into learning opportunities. You will be presented with extraordinary resources that the country and the world desperately need, and we're thrilled to present to you today. I want to give a special thank you to the fam uh, Bezos Family Foundation for bringing these new resources to First Book's community of educators and for making today's webinar possible. Now, it's my pleasure to turn things over to our speakers, Ellen Galinsky and Aaron Ramsey. Thank you so much, Kyle. It's a pleasure to be, be with you. Um, for those, I, I'm watching the accolades come in, in in the chat, keep them up. It's really wonderful to read about. Uh, I happened to be at the very first meeting when um, this idea that became First Book was discussed. So. Uh, we do go way back. Um, I would like to say hello to all of those who put their places and names into the chat too. Particularly thrilling for me was that I heard uh, people from my home state, I don't live there anymore, I'm in New York, but from my home state, West Virginia, someone even from my hometown, Charleston, West Virginia. So that that was a special hello from one Charlestoner to another. Um, let's start with executive function. I remember the first time I heard those words, and I don't know how many uh, of you are familiar with that concept, but I would love you to write for a moment in the chat what you think when you hear the word executive function. And wheeling too. So enter a word um, that you hear when you hear the word executive function, or two words. I'll give you a minute, and uh, while you're thinking of the words, I remember what I thought. I'll I'll tell you in a moment. Okay, do we have uh, enough to begin to share them? Planning, organizing, organization. Need to go back and see the chat organization, organization, brain development. Well, the first thing that 
actually, it was a board member of mine at the Family and Work Institute who said this. Uh, she said that executive functions sound like a, a guy in a pinstripe suit bossing you around in your brain. Um, it, it's interesting, um, self-regulation, that's a very good name, because executive function actually is part of uh, self-regulation. Executive function and challenging behavior. We're going to share with you today a new, and I'm going to define it in a moment, but a new approach and a new res resource. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And this is how we're going to walk uh, through this with you. We're going to share a challenge. We're going to talk about what executive function is and then what skills based on executive functions are. We're going to share some strategies to deal uh, with these challenges and uh, including an opportunity mindset and that will get you to solutions. So it is um, really a new new research and a new approach. Okay. I'm going to give you another exercise. Even though we, we have 750 people who have signed up, we want this to be very interactive. Um, think for a moment of a challenging behavior, an experience where a child was very challenging and write one word to describe it. We're going to have that um, meter coming up again. Is the, is the meter coming up again? I can't tell if it is. I don't see it. Is the... Fighting, screaming, fighting, stress. Okay, can you share what we found, what this one word is? Is it possible to share it? Whoa, that's beautiful. I love that. Frustrating, tantrum, overwhelming, biting, trauma, meltdown, out of control, frustration. That's fabulous. Okay. That's really beautiful. Let's go on to the next one. And uh, I want you now to think of a solution um, and to, again, uh, how you would handle this particular challenging situation that you saw. Think of a solution and then write one word to describe it. So let's see what your words are. I know that it's really hard. You can put it in the Mentime Mentimeter. Is that how you say it? Mentimeter, uh, right there. Um, but it's hard to think of one word for a solution. So boil it down, if you can, to one word. And I'll give you um, another 40, 50 seconds to write that down. Breathe, hug, <laughs> patience, hugs. I'm going to give you a little bit more time. Love, compassion, difficult, space. You're good at one words, compassion. Okay, can we put up the word cloud again? Let's see what people said. Blow bubbles. <laughs> That's great. Understanding, calm, empathy, patience, breathing, soothing, label feelings, refocus. Really good solutions. We're going to get back to those at the very end. So hold on to your uh, in your mind to that one solution, and we're going to go forward um, again with a challenge. Um, we started with a challenge, now we're moving on to executive function uh, based skills. And uh, uh, about 20 years ago, I, 
I better wanted to better understand child development and went around particularly how to keep the fire for learning burning in children's eyes, which was the impetus for Mind in the Making. And I went around uh, the country uh, talking to researchers with a film camera um, with me to film the best research in child development. And what I discovered, I had this amazing opportunity that not many people have, but what I discovered was that across the different disciplines, across different kinds of research, some people were studying cognitive development, some people were studying social or emotional development or putting it all together. Some people were uh, studying linguistics or literacy or um, the development of numeracy or all kinds of different areas, um, social relationships. Across all of those areas, uh, I began to see a pattern, um, which is that when children were thriving, they were using a certain kind of skill. And those skills are called executive function skill. Okay, let's um, move on. Um, and when you ask what they are, uh, let's look at first how they're measured. This is a, a, a child we filmed in the lab of Phil Zalazzo at the University of Minnesota. And uh, you can see that he's got a, a picture, well, you can't see, but he's got a picture and it's either of red or blue and it's a truck or it's a star. And he is putting that picture uh, in the right box. If the, if the researcher says sort by um, color, he would put the color that he has into the uh, same color box. And if it's short by, sort by shape, he'd, he'd put that into either a star or a truck shape. Um, so if you break that apart, what's happening there is that he's had to think about the rules. The rules are either, either playing the color or the shape game. He's had to remember those. He's had to pay attention. He's had to be flexible because the rules are changing, sort by color, short, sort by shape. And he can't go on automatic. This is really requiring a high degree of skill. This actual game, which you can see physically, has been made into a, a computer game, and it's a way of measuring executive functions. So what is executive function? Executive function is um, the mechanisms in our brain that pull together our social, our emotional, and our cognitive capacities to achieve a goal. We use them when there's a problem, when we're having to use the information that we have. And they consist of three things, working memory, that child is having to remember the rules, cognitive flexibility, having to be flexible, and inhibitory control. Um, Computer is having trouble going on to the next slide. Aaron, you want to move the next? Uh, maybe it'll work here. Okay, great. Um, I think I fixed it. These skills make it possible um, for us to keep information in, in our minds so that we can use it, to think flexibly in response to changing situations, and to resist the temptation to go on to automatic. They are attentional skills because where we focus, where we're paying attention is what we do. Um, and um, there are lots of studies that, that show how important they are. You, you might know this particular working paper, paper number 11, at the Harvard Center um, on the Developing Child. And um, the, this paper called uh, Executive Function Skills the Air Traffic Controller of the Brain. In other words, these pull together our capacities so that we can act particularly when we need to act uh, in ways that are important to us. Um, one of the things that I love about this paper is that they talk about how children need to learn content, and that's the what of learning. But executive function skills are the how of learning. They're how we learn, and that's what makes them particularly important. That's why I think you see in so many studies that they are predictive, for example, of academic achievement. Numbers of studies have shown that children who have good executive function skills are more likely to do well in school. Studies, this is a study that I particularly love. This was done by Megan McClellan. Um, I'll talk about her later. Uh, she was not studying executive function skills. She was doing a study of adoptive children, comparing children who were adopted 
and uh, uh, twins who were adopted and grew up in different kinds of families to see what was what was seemingly hereditary and, and what wasn't. But she found across, in across the groups that the four-year-olds who had what she called attention span persistence, that is, they could start something and stay on task, um, that was strongly predictive of whether these same children graduated from college when they were 25 years um, old. Now, what was amazing about this is it almost pre predicted about half of the variance in the scores. Uh, you don't get that kind of uh, statistical validity in many studies. So these skills are really quite powerful. Um, this is another study that I particularly love. It was done in Dunedin, New Zealand. It's a city that I've been to. And uh, they began to follow children at birth and have followed them up through 32 years at, of age to look at what helps them uh, thrive, sur both uh, survive and thrive. And they found in a number of different analyses, which this particular paper pulls together, that the kids who were good at executive function skills, particularly self-control, um, were uh, in better health. They were less likely to, to use drugs. They had fewer criminal convictions and they were wealthier. In other words, health and wealth at age 32. And this was more important than their socioeconomic status or their IQ. So these skills are very important. A number of studies have shown that these skills are in fact more important uh, than IQ in whether or not that we thrive because they, we are using what we know. Now, when you think about what these skills underlie, um, they underlie things like communication. If you're going to communicate well, you need to be able to not just go on automatic and say anything that comes into your head. You need to think about who your audience is and how you're going to say what you're going to say to them in a way that will be heard. Uh, problem solving skills. Again, not just randomly solving a problem, but thinking strategically about how you might solve that problem. Ability to work in a team. That takes perspective taking. Uh, that takes the skill of understanding how other people think and feel so that you can work with them rather than against them. And uh, initiative. A lot of you wrote the words about organization and management. And one of my concerns about the growing popularity of of executive function skills is that people just think it's it's you know listening to the teacher and sitting in the chair when these skills are critical yes to behavior management and that's what we're going to talk about but also to being able to communicate to having initiative to being creative um, so it is much more than just simply um, self-regulation or managing your behavior why do I talk about these um, four particular skills? Because when employers were surveyed, and this is a survey that happens every year, the National Employer, a uh, National Association of Jobs uh, of Colleges and Employer 2019 Job Outlook Survey, employers were asked, "What are the most important things you look for when you're hiring something?" And ex and these are the skills that came came up to the top, and they're the skills that repeatedly come up to the top. Um, in, in these. So these are not only skills for now, but they're skills for la later. Sisney Cisneros knows of the, uh, the conference board says, these are the things that our employers are looking for, um, even more so than technical ability, which they think they can teach people. So from this list of skills, um, I found seven skills, life skills, that are particularly important. And, and they are similar to mega skills. You're exactly right. Um, these are skills based, all of them are based on using the core executive function skills of being able to focus, to use your working memory, to use cognitive flexibility, to uh, inhibitory control, and then reflection, to think back on what's happening so that you can solve whatever problem you're solving in a, ref in a reflective way and not just, again, on automatic. So all of these skills are based on that. It, these weren't skills that I just made up. Um, focus and self-control, perspective taking, I've talked about that, communicating, I've talked about, making connections is the notion of symbolic representation, which is uh, having, if you think about it, I'll just use an example. These are my glasses. And if you see them, you can see that they're glasses. But if you also saw G-L-A-S-S-E-S, -S -S, that's symbolic representation. The word G-L-A-S-S-E-S, -S -S -E -S, 
stands for the sounds that says glasses and the concept of glasses, which you see. And that is fundamental, if you think about it, to all of our knowledge. Symbolic representation underlies all of our knowledge. And these skills are critical to that, but also to making unusual connections. That's the basis of creativity. Um, thinking about how things go together in different ways, in new ways, in unique ways, in ways that are useful. Critical thinking is the search for valid and reliable information so that we have a basis for acting. Taking on challenges. A lot of us talk about resilience, but I've always thought of resilience as that Cupid doll. If you hit the to the ground, then the bounces back up. Hit it to the ground, bounces back up. The, the skill that's just one notch above that is taking on challenges, which is you bounce back up, but then you can try the next hard thing. And I think that is critical, as we all know from the time we've been in in COVID, uh, to uh, trying um, trying that next hard thing. And they all go together to ensure that we are self-directed and engaged learners. So we've now looked at, we have a challenge. We know that these skills need to underlying it. Um, we need to then think of what are the strategies that we use so that we can promote these skills rather than just manage me, managing behavior. Our goal, Aaron's and my goal, is to help people promote skills in children, not just managing the challenging moment. So what are the strategies that are important? Uh, for a very, very long time, I had looked at what comes before executive function skills. They begin to emerge very early, that baby who is stopping crying is using a form of self-control. Um, that baby figures out how, to, when, you, when, you, when the baby wants something and reaches for something, what's gonna work with the, with the adults that he or she is around. Uh, those are the origins of executive function skills, perspective taking, focus and self-control and so forth. But, um, but they really begin to emerge during the preschool years in a much more developed way. What comes before it? And obviously the place to look is in how adults raise children. And um, even after my book was published, um, a new field of research began to emerge that's called autonomy support. Um, here's an example of it. This is Stephanie Carlson, also at the University of Minnesota. And in this particular experiment, the child is given a puzzle that's just a little bit hard, too hard for the child to do. And the adult is told, um, you can uh, help in any way that you feel comfortable with um, uh, to help the child do the puzzle. And then the, the uh, researchers, the experimenters, observe how the parent helps and have found that parents who, um, who help in ways that take the child's view, to give the child choices, um, that uh, don't fix things for children, are going to have children who are better at, at solving that puzzle. Um, in other words, the child is going to learn for herself or himself how to solve that puzzle. And that is autonomy support. Um, and that uh, begins to underlie executive function. Here's another study with school-aged children. This is Wendy Grolnick at Clark University. And uh, she gave a, asked parents to help kids with homework assignments. Uh, that one homework assignment was reading a map. Another homework assignment was writing a quatrain or a poem. And uh, uh, the parents helped and then looked at whether, how much the parents helped the child or did the homework for the child versus helped the child again uh, figure out how to do those tasks, both of which were, were challenging uh, in ways that helped the child gain skills. And again, autonomy support uh, came to the surface. Again, autonomy support is helping the child learn to do things for himself or herself. And you'll see the characteristics that underlie it in a moment. Um, as I looked at this literature, and then as Aaron and I did, we found that it made a difference uh, it, in the development of children's executive function skills. It was a precursor. It was predictive of, chi of, of children's um, EF skills beyond their parents' own skills. That's a study that we did. And uh, you could say, well, they've just inherited it. Parent, you know, parents are good at it. We'll have kids who are good at it. And it's, it's, it's just in the genes. But we could look at, uh, because we gave parents executive functions uh, skill tests, as well as children, we could look to see that children's uh, capacity at executive function 
is not just inherited, it really is taught. And that's what's so important. So let's look at what, what these strategies are. As we looked across a number of studies that show that they were so predictive of good things for children, we saw the following five different characteristics. The first is take the child's view. Can the adult um, figure out why the child is behaving this way? Can the adult figure out what the child wants to communicate? Behavior is a communication. So what's a child, even though the child may be having a temper tantrum and an outburst and the kinds of things that you wrote about, what is the child trying to say? Um, and then what, what, where is the child developmentally? What can the child do or not be able to do? So that's really important as a precursor uh, of, of, of autonomy support, understanding the child and the child's view. Sharing reasons, not just saying do it because I said do it. It's time to give up that uh, cell phone and just do it because I said do it. No, there's a reason uh, why. And sharing that reason with the child. Uh, lots of research for many decades have, has shown that if children understand why the adult is asking what the adult is asking, they're much more likely to be in, um, uh, compliant um, to do what the adult says. Um, and uh, that's important. Uh, providing choices. Um, research that Stephanie Carlson has recently done, uh, in fact, in a paper that we have that's coming out fairly soon, it showed that providing choices was one of the most important of these five things. Uh, not too many choices, not choices about everything. Um, ha how many of you have been um, out with parents who say, would you like to put your seatbelt on? Okay, that isn't a real choice. Or what would you like for breakfast? And then the child will say pancakes and there are no pancakes. So unlimited choices or unrealistic choices, no, but real choices and limited choices. And then scaffold. And scaffold is like that support that you put beside a building when you're building it, which is... Um, giving the children support so that they can begin to loot, uh, use it for themselves. It's helping the child uh, take on that next uh, challenging task, um, following the child's pace and providing a challenge that's hard but not too hard so that the child can do it. Um, those are the five strategies that underlie autonomy support. And we have used these strategies um, in, in the material that the new resource that we've created for you. The next one is autonomy uh, is an opportunity mindset. And um, so many of us have talked about a growth mindset. Uh, last summer for a book that I'm writing about adolescence, uh, I decided to really explore um, what gets underneath the fact that most of us want to do well by our children, but we don't always do it. So what happens when we lose it? That was my question. And I was interviewing, I did a nationally representative survey of, of close to 2,000 uh, adolescents beginning in the ninth grade up through high school and their parents. And then I interviewed 60 of them in, in person, parents separately and the child separately. And I'd say, tell me about a time when you lost it, when you weren't your best self, what was happening? And then we would listen and figure out together, the parent and I on the phone, what was going on. And what we found was two things um, that were going on. In one case, uh, the parents could might have an adversity mindset. That is, things really won't change. My child won't or can't be different or chooses not to be different, and I can't make a difference. That's what we think of as an, ad an adversity mindset. So things won't change. Um, and um, and then the next part of it is a growth mindset, is like a growth mindset, but more than that. It's what we call an opportunity mindset. And the way that we tested this in the research, we went out and did another study I did for the book that I'm doing. The way that we tested this is that we looked at the kinds of things that parents said. For example, we asked them how much they agreed or how often they responded when children do things that are wrong, I think about the possible reasons about why they may have acted that way. I'm curious about the reasons. Or when children do things that are wrong, I see it as an opportunity for me to better understand their thoughts or feelings. You can see the components of, of uh, skill building strategies under that. Or when children do things that are wrong, um, 
in the moment, um, it's not a sign for the future. In other words, it's more than a growth mindset. The growth mindset is things can change. This is things can change and I can make them change. And that's what an opportunity mindset is. And so our view is that if you have a challenge, um, the, that we want you, you know, we, we think that it's really helpful. We, we hope that you will think about what are the skills that I can promote from this challenge? Not just how can I manage this, this behavior, but how can I promote a skill using skill building strategies and an opportunity mindset? So now I'm going to turn this over to Aaron Ramsey, my colleague, uh, whom I've had the joy of working with for the last eight, nine years, and uh, she's going to share what we did. Thanks, Ellen. And it's such an honor to be um, here with First Book, our awesome partner. And seeing all our familiar friends in the chat is super exciting, too. So at this point, after Ellen sharing the research and all the components of what we're looking at is really the premise of, you know, getting away from punitive actions and into real learning. And that's where the opportunity mindset comes from. But what I want you to look at is the first solution that you wrote down, right? And, and then I'm going to ask you a question about it. So think of the problem that you thought about in the beginning, and then what did you do to solve it? And now I'm going to take you over to a poll. And what I want you to ask yourself, and it's this is meant to be strictly like an awareness, almost funny, because what Ellen and I have found in so many of the speeches and interviews and work that we've done with so many of you is and in our own lives with our grandchildren and our own children is we often most people will fix the problem and that looks very the challenge right and so think about your first solution and see if you actually fixed it and fixing it often looks like oh that child's fidgety at circle time so i'm going to give him a fidget toy right the question is how do you know that that fidget toy is what's really going to help that child so it's you just giving the option to fix the problem. All right, so keep responding. We're having a good outcome here. Ellen, do you want to add anything about that How, when we pull all the teachers? Can you think yeah, of another example? Um, the first time I did this was for a group of about 500 teachers in, um, in California, and, and they actually wrote out in more than one word. You can't do that in a poll, but you can do it when you're live with people. Uh, we we gave them a piece of paper and they wrote down their 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 problem and then we asked them to write down their solution just as we did with you today and then I collected them and brought them home and the majority of them fixed them for the child I would say 95 percent of that particular teacher group uh, fixed them for the child they did wonderful caring kind generous beautiful things with the children but they didn't say how can I use this as a moment to help the child learn how to fix it for themselves? I love the story about mommy putting on the shoes in the chat. Um, we tend to put on the shoes rather than helping the child learn to put on the shoes. But it's like the parable teaching a child to fish. Uh, they won't be hungry. So, right. um, Yeah, and I'd like to tie this back to our own executive function as adults and how much um, we need to be using our own executive function by stepping back inhibiting our own responses and reactions, thinking flexibly about the situation, right? Using your working memory and past experiences with that particular child or, or in other particular situations that it's us always going back to what role are we playing so that we aren't on automatic and fixing things. It's it, once you start to think about it in this context, I think you will be surprised. I know I was of how much I actually was fixing things and not even realizing it because we're not malicious you know we're in this field for a good reason but it is taking it to the next level of our practice okay so let's look at the could give, Aaron could I give an example sure. um, one of my favorite examples was a child who was wiggly at circle time and um, couldn't sit still and so what the teacher did was give the child a squeegee to squeeze so that he wouldn't be so fidgety and it felt like not fixing it for the child, but the child didn't help come up with a solution. So right. um, that that's an example of how we can do these wonderful things, but we're not really helping the child learn to solve that particular problem by himself. Right. 
Okay, so let's see what the poll results are. So 35% said you fixed it. That was good reflection. And 38, or, yeah, no, 64% said that um, you did not fix it. So that's that's really good percentages. Um, and then think of other, other challenges that you're facing. Okay, so now if you revamped your um, question, your challenge and your answer to the solution, or if you already feel like you didn't fix it, Go ahead and click on here about which of the autonomy support components or skill building strategies that you actually used. And so that could be take the child's view. So you're actually stepping back using your own executive functions, seeing what this child might be thinking and feeling, using your perspective taking, understanding where they are developmentally. Um, and then did you share reasons? Right. So what you know, with the boundaries of providing choices. So why is this not OK? And then here's some options, but then bringing the child into the joint problem solving. So many, a lot of times when I write about this and think about it and work it in my own life is really thinking about um, how do we make a plan after the fact? A lot of the times you just need to get through the challenge and then revisit it in a really proactive way so that the child, because it's hard, you can't, you can't come up with good ideas when you're totally stressed out but because your executive function is being compromised, <laughs> but you can, after the fact, go back and make a plan and make a plan in a way that it's not punitive or that they're in trouble. Just like this is probably going to happen again. What are some other ways we can handle it together? What can I do to help you? What can you, what do you think might help yourself? And then there's no failure around it. It's just like, let's try it. And if it doesn't work, we'll come back and use plan B. It, it could be a whole process. It's a whole different approach that, we don't need to get people in trouble. We need to help people learn how to get to their best selves and function and, and learn the most they can. That's where the scaffolding comes in. And then if you if you use um, adopting an opportunity mindset, instead of seeing everything as a problem and really trying to see everything as an opportunity and the role that you play in that opportunity. So let's see, I think we gave you enough time here. How about, Five more seconds to click all the things that you used. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the poll results. Ellen, do you wanna add anything there? Um, no, but I think that this is, it's really a good, you know, having this checklist is a really good diagnosis. And I see that um, um, Carolyn wrote in the chat, high scope, yay, and it's plan, do, review plan do review at high scope is is promoting executive function one of the reasons that i've always thought that the perry preschool project succeeded was because children were able to make plans for themselves do an activity and then review the activity so if you look at abecedarian or or high scope or any of the uh, research on the early childhood programs that are particularly success, successful they build in without even thinking about it maybe not knowing its name they build in executive function type skills. Yeah, I love I love how it always comes full circle. Also, what I love about this checklist is, is particularly when I'm doing training, is that this is where the rubber meets the road. Like a lot of a lot of us will struggle on okay, what does scaffolding really look like, or what does share reasons really look like? And Ellen and I and Stephanie and several other experts in the field really really, really worked hard on making sure the definition was clear so that it would guide the adult because we don't want you to get laissez-faire. You know, that's what happens in autonomy support. You can either get too laissez-faire where I don't know what to do, so I'm going to do nothing, or you get over controlling and start fixing everything. And what we want is in the middle. And I think that these definitions really help because it provides space for reflection to really think how, how you're going to navigate it. Okay, so here's the poll results. All right, so 48% takes the child's view. Yes, we're very good at that. 37% uh, share reasons. That's good. And I like how it's just a couple, not too many. Um, provide choices, same. You know, you don't want to go on a dissertation around sharing reasons why it's not going to work. Same with providing choices. You don't want to give, you know, 10 choices, you know, two or three. Uh, joint problem solving, 34%. Scaffolding, 18% and an opportunity mindset, 15%. Great. So this is um, really good information. So what we did, Ellen, you wanna add anything? 
No, I think this is so useful for us to help us know um, what we're doing and, and where it's meeting a need that, that you all have. That's our purpose, just as, as it is First Book's purpose. Right. And if you tie it around, I think it's really the honesty around the opportunity mindset percentages of only 15 percent. I think it's so good to tie that back to executive function and our own life skills that there's nothing wrong with us. We just need we have skills to develop and we get to choose the frame that we operate from opportunity to learn or opportunity to get somebody in trouble. And um, so if we look at it as a frame of learning, uh, it will make your job more fun, <laughs> to be honest, I think. All right. So I'm gonna, we're going to share. We're going to go over. Ellen and I are just going to share the opportunity that First Book and the Mind in the Making Team Bezos Family Foundation has put together for you. And we created, we are creating 40 pairings, we're referring to them. And they're, they're, they're sort of like a, a tip sheet, basically, that gives you a challenge. And then, you know, what are the things to look at around it? What is the opportunity? And then we fill in things that you can actually do um, with those different components of autonomy, support, or skill building strategies. Um, and you can, and we've done them by life skill as well. So you can plug in focus and self-control. So when you're talking to families, and we hope that the, the, the goal here is for you to get this information to the families in your programs and in your schools. So let's say you're having a child with a particular challenge, you can just print one of these out or opt in and get the pairing and then print it out or cut and paste it or email it or electronic. There'll be all kinds of versions for you to use so that you and, the, you and the families can get on the same page. And using the life skill at the bottom of each of these uh, tip sheets was really good because people understand focus and self-control and that it's, it's an action oriented life skill that can be developed through specific things. And on these pairings, you can um, get the, the actual action steps you can take and parents can take or families. And I, I do wanna say something here, Erin, which is that we didn't make up these challenges uh, we uh, first book did a survey of 2,500 or so of, of you, both parents and professionals. And we asked during the pandemic right now, what are the biggest challenges you have? So every single quote that you read here is real. These, these are the things you told us that um, either parents or, or, or you would like help with. Um, so we're very excited to respond to the real challenges that you've shared with us. Yeah. And like everything that we do together, Ellen, I think it would be fair for me to say if you have other challenges and you want some response, you just reach out to us because we really want to know the reality of what's happening. And hopefully we can help plug in the research um, for you and, and your families and your communities. Yes, yeah, there's, some questions, gonna... Aaron. there's some questions. Uh, someone asked and I don't this this would be. Uh, Bruce, who's managing the screen, but he's somebody's wondering whether we can make them bigger. I don't know if we can, but you can download them and we're going to be releasing two a week. Uh, Bonnie will explain that. And yes, they are available in Spanish. Yeah. So here are and just more as languages as, as, as need. You know, we're, these are really hot off the press. These are so hot off the press that they're really sizzling right now. <laughs> <laughs> they're on fire. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So here's just a few examples. And then what I'm going to do is hand it over to Bonnie from First Book so she can tell you how to opt in and how you actually will use it within your systems through the First Book um, chain of information. But we are really excited about this. We would love your input if you opt in and you and First Book's very iterative with us. So um, any other new challenges or things that are working well for you or things that aren't working well for you, please, you know, keep in touch with Ellen and I. So I'm going to hand it over to Bonnie in the interim. If you have any questions that you want Ellen to answer or me to answer, then um, we're, we'll stay on and we're happy to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was terrific. Um, I am really, really grateful to you both, um, Aaron and Ellen, for sharing those insights and all the amazing research that's gone into creating these skill building opportunities. Um, I just want to quickly put a reminder that um, we do have a Q&A section. Um, so would love for folks, if you've got questions following the presentation that you would like Aaron and Ellen to answer, please go ahead and put those in that, um, in that section and then we can talk about those as soon as I'm finished with this slide. 
So um, just wanted to share here again, of course, that we're so excited to be working closely with this amazing research team to bring these um, resources to you guys. Um, I think as Kyle mentioned earlier in her introduction, our accelerator resources are actionable, highly successful strategies. And these are really designed for how you can view these tough moments with young kids as more than just behavioral struggles, but as opportunities to help kids strengthen these important life skills that we've been talking about and to help the adults in their lives foster that growth positively. So now that you've heard this research that supports them, um, we've shown you a little bit of what they look like on the screen. Um, here is how the educators that we work with in our network and the care providers can sign up to receive this series from first book delivered weekly to your email um, to both support your family engagement work as well as for use in your own classes and programs um, so we do have two that are available right now on the landing page that we're going to share with you but they will be um, delivered once a week to your email inbox so everyone who's registered for this webinar will receive an email from first book with a link to a short survey just to collect some basic information to opt in for the weekly resource series. Um, the downloadable PDFs will be available in the email in both English and Spanish, and they will provide a simple and straightforward touch point for you to pass on to families and use on a regular basis. Additionally, we're also going to share a link to the Skill Building Opportunities webpage, which is on the first book site. And there you can learn more about our partnership and opt in to receive this series. You can access the recording from today's webinar, as well as access all the published resources from the series as they become available each week for anyone who may join midway through the series. So please feel free to share this opportunity with friends and colleagues um, who are also working with children in this age range and might not have been able to join today or might not be familiar with um, this resource that we're making available. So um, I would love to turn now to questions. Um, I see we've got some that have been entered in here. So I've got Ellen and Aaron, thank you guys for joining me again. Um, I wanna start with one question that we got um, from Christine, which is how do you reconcile autonomous support with children who are neurodiverse? Autonomous support looks very different among children who have different skill sets, development and capabilities. Great question. Um, that's the reason that um, take the child's view is, is number one in as an autonomy support. Uh, skill building strategy because all children, you know, a three year old will be different. We're doing these for four through eight year olds, but just think of a three year old different from an eight year old um, and a neurodiverse child with different ways of being neurodiverse are, are different from each other. So, knowing what the child can and can't do is critical, but whatever the child can do in ways that are not pressured, in ways that are in ways that are affirming and empowering and positive, um, children can often do more than we think that they can. So they can maybe brainstorm solutions. Um, they can have choices. Um, they can, um, you can scaffold with something that they can do that something that's just a little tiny bit harder. So um, I think that that is um, very critical for all children that we, we understand their capacities, what this child can or can't do both developmentally and, and then in terms of, of their own um, development. Yeah, that's great, that's great. Erin, did you wanna jump in here? Aaron, did you want to add? Yeah, I think that's a great question and it comes up all the time. And you know, there are differing abilities and, and different ways to respond, but I think one of my most important things that I always say is that we just meet people where they are. Um, because, you know, that's the only way you can scaffold. That's the only way you can take their view. So meet them where they are. I noticed that's awesome. while we're the next question that we have um, someone writing about tools of the mind. And tools of the mind um, is I'm on the board of tools in the mind. So um, here's truth and advertising. Uh, I, I know it well. <laughs> I'm a big fan. It's one of the few curricular approaches that does use executive function skills. And they've done so many wonderful things um, in, in 
teaching reading and teaching writing in ways that help children gain the skill themselves rather than just be told this skill and this skill and this skill. They put them all together. They share with children what skill they're using. I think that's another important thing, acknowledging the skill um, as a part of learning. There are brainy buddies, another thing that Tools of the Mind does that I really love, so that children help each other. And that's a great way also uh, to respond to neurodiversity. Mm -hmm. And the, and the groupings that Tools of the Mind does are not ability groupings. Every child works with every other child um, and everyone can be a helper and, and a receiver of help. Um, and that's, that's uh, and they get a chance to rehearse something, uh, try out something uh, before they do it. It's also play-based and we know that children, young children learn the most through, as just as we do playing in our mind, they play physically <laughs> and learn the most that way. So uh, I'm a big fan of, of um, Tools of the Mind as, as one approach to uh, promoting executive function skills and scaffolding. And scaffolding is actually not, a, I always thought it was a word that Vygotsky said. Uh, actually, it was Jerome Bruner who uh, talked about scaffolding. At, he was at NYU, who talked about scaffolding and increasing difficulty. But it's very much a, a, a Vygotsky idea about the zone of proximal development. You see, where the next steps are, and then you help them reach for it. Great explanation, thank you, thank you. Um, so this one's a little bit of a, gonna steal our thunder on some of our resources, but let's ask this anyway, which is um, what are strategies that can be used to help prevent meltdowns, and how might some of those be different than what you would do once the tantrum has already started? What are strategies that can prevent melt, meltdowns? Yeah. What is what are some ways that that they can be prevented before they <laughs> before they turn into the tantrum? Um, there again, uh, if you notice the resource that we've created, we ask. We, there's the challenge, and then it's figure out why. And that figure out why is there on every single one of of this these tip sheets because it's so critical. If you can see that this particular child is about to have a meltdown when that child plays with another child or is hungry or is tired or doesn't have the words to express what the child wants, if you know why, if you can figure out why, then you can prevent it. And that ultimately is our goal. Um, you can say to the child, uh, uh, you know, I can see this coming. Let's go get some food because you're really hungry. Um, and you're going to make a better decision then when you're not so hungry or um, you and this other, uh, say you and um, Danny always clash. So how are you going to work with Danny in a way that you don't get into the usual arguments? And what are Danny's ideas about this? And what are your ideas? Say that's my real grandson's name. Danny is a made up kid. <laughs> Aaron? Perfect. Aaron, anything to add? I think that covers it really well. Great. Um, so we've got a question from Alex, which is, how does adopting an opportunity mindset coincide with a strengths-based approach? Strengths-based approach. Is using the word wrong to define what a child does appropriate from an autonomy perspective? Well, those are two different questions. Um, they are, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. They're yeah, listed in one. Great, yeah. Two great questions. So the first one is, um, say it again, I got interested in the second one. The, do the first part The first again. one was, how does, how does adopting an opportunity mindset coincide with a strengths-based approach? Well, it is a strength-based approach. I, I think it coincides beautifully because a strength-based approach is building on the assets or the strengths, not the weaknesses that the child or you have. So if you're going to see what are challenges, what are typically challenges as opportunities right away. That's one that is one technique for, for uh, building on strengths. I'll bounce it over to my colleague, Aaron. I agree completely. That's exactly right. This is grounded in everything that we do. Mm -hmm. Everything that Ellen and I do or decide to do is always based on the strengths of the individual. In fact, I wrote a paper that came pouring out of me about a year ago about how we need to move away 
beyond trauma-informed care. It's been a very important concept in our field because it's helped us understand why children might be the kind of child who will act now and think later, um, that their life experience has, has either made them very reactive or less reactive, hypo, hyper reactive. And it, and that in that way, a trauma-informed approach has been critically important. But the danger of a trauma-informed approach is that children become seen as their worst trauma or we label children or we don't move on to the strengths. So um, in the paper that came pouring out of me with a passion, and we can send it to any of you who want it, um, it was published by the Brookings Institute, it was that we need to that uh, that trauma informed is a first step, but asset informed is a second step, and that takes what we understand about the behavior, but then move to res respond to it in a in a strength based way. Mm, yeah, that's great. Yeah, what was that one um, quote, Ellen, that you always say from the the focus group in San Francisco that that researcher did? I am not the worst thing that happened to me. Yeah, I love yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Me too. That's great. Um, and so just quickly, the second part of the question, yeah, yeah, was, is using the word wrong, quote unquote, to define what a child does appropriate from an autonomy perspective? Um, I, I used that word in the survey because it, it, it had emotional appeal. Um, wrong connotes good and evil. Um, you might want to describe it that way, but you might also want to describe it in terms of its impact on other people. And so rather than simply being wrong, which doesn't give you much information, it's why. Uh, so if you hurt someone, you could say that's wrong. But what did you learn from it? Why does hurting someone hurt? Because if you were hurt too, you would feel it. It, it wouldn't feel good. So um, mm -hmm. this is called in the research, and, and Martin Hoffman is the person who pioneered this approach. It's called other oriented discipline, where you share what the reason is and how your behavior affects other people. And it's more effective, uh, Martin Hoffman's studies found to use rather than right or wrong, to use what he called other oriented discipline, where you're sharing why this particular behavior affects uh, and why and how this behavior affects other people. Um, and that, again, that goes back to the strategy that that we talk about, which is sharing reasons. Um, you know why you're behaving, you know, why you want to behave in that way. Erin, why don't you talk, though, about the golden rule and the platinum rule? Yeah, I will. I want to add on to that about the other orientated is where the opportunity mindset really comes into play, I think, because when you're talking about other orientated discipline, it really is about the opportunity for the child to learn, not to like force perspective taking or shame onto the behavior, but to really step back through executive function and to see like all the variables um, of what happened and why it happened, right? So it's, it shouldn't come from a place of um, punitive, it should come from a place of learning, which is what opportunity mindset is. Yeah, so in perspective taking, um, which, is just a, 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 a genius skill to have, right? And Ellen put it together beautifully in Mind of the Making. And a lot of people think perspective taking is empathy. And part of it is empathy, but it's way more than empathy. And researchers call it theory of mind, where you actually have to step back out of your own thoughts and feelings and think about what somebody else might be thinking and feeling, even if you don't feel it. Empathy is I feel what you feel. Perspective taking is I don't necessarily feel it, but I can step back and think about it from your perspective. And that is um, critical life skill. So what we say is that, um, you know, we've been raised and our culture is somewhat indoctrinated around the golden rule that you do unto others as they want to be done unto. But we really like to look at a good perspective taking as the platinum rule is that you do unto others as they want to be done unto. And we do that through communication and inhibiting our own thoughts and feelings and every, every component of executive function you can imagine. And think about how our world would be if we were all really good perspective takers. So, um, so I think opportunity mindset, the platinum rule, and you know, the other orientated discipline can really address all those things in a way that will promote learning. 
I love that. And, and I can't believe I've been working with you guys as long as I have. And that's the first time hearing about the platinum rule. So I'm, I'm thrilled to now have that um, to be able to use at my disposal. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't come, we didn't come up with the platinum rule, but it does fit perfectly <laughs> in the perspective of taking uh, yeah. a good example is um, if you, if you're feeling sad, you might like to be hugged, but another child might not like to be hugged. So you, you need to think about what you feel and what you would like and understand what, or try to understand what the other person would feel and what the other person would like and uh, your be, uh, move forward accordingly. So it's taking the other child's yeah. likes and dislikes and culture because very, very much of this is, is culture related. Whether you look someone in the eye or you don't, whether you want to be hugged or you don't, uh, those things um, are, are, are different for different cultures and we need to be very mindful of those. Excellent points, all excellent points. Okay, um, I've got another one from Melissa, who is asking, how can you encourage and promote self-control in tweens and teens? Which also sort of leads to another question that we got, which is, um, which you could maybe lead right into, which is when will the adolescent research that you uh, referred to, Ellen, be available? Um, the forthcoming book is called uh, The Breakthrough Years. And it's five things every adolescent wants us to know and new research that shows why we should listen. So it's very much based on studies that I did of adolescents and of their parents um, in um, multiple surveys, um, as well as a behavioral study, a, a, an executive function study that we did in, in 22 different school districts. Um, and it will be published on Valentine's Day, not this year, but next year. But we will begin, I will begin to be talking about it beforehand. So how can you deal with um, emotional outburst in, in tweens and teens? Um, I think that the same process is, uh, holds. This is not just a pro, this is a process for your husband or your wife. This is a process <laughs> for your adolescence. Uh, during adolescence, it's, it's as powerful a change time as the early childhood years are. Um, the brain is changing that dramatically. And one of the things that young people are learning is to, is to um, set more goals, to have more self-control, to, um, and, and there's been a kind of a, a story that is in the media that, that, that kids' emotional development outpaces their self-control. And that is very contextually uh, based. In other words, if you put kids in one situation, they can have really good self-control and another situation they wouldn't. So it's not that they don't have the skills of self-control. They do. It's the environment that they're in affects whether they're, they're going to be able to using them. And, and it's a time of very rapidly learning those kinds of skills. Um, there are all kinds of techniques, um, hundreds of techniques uh, for, for, for um, using self-control. I think that um, I'll, I'll use an emotional regulation one. Um, researchers have talked about, this is um, the research of Jennifer Silvers at UCLA, and she's talked about taking a near and far perspective. So one of the ways that you can help children, teens and tweens from overreacting is helping them not take a, like an immediate perspective but helping them step back and look at the situation as if they were a fly on the wall. They can have much better self-control skills then than if they're just feeling what it feels. Another technique, I'll do one more. This is the, this is the research of, of Ethan Kroos um, at the University of Michigan. He's found that if you talk about yourself in the, in the third person or second person, um, Ellen, why would you do such a thing? Um, Ellen, what do you really want to happen? that if you do something that simple, it, it gives you, it, it enables executive functions uh, skills to, uh, to happen in the brain in a, in a much better way, um, more facilitated way than if, if you talk about yourself in the first person, which is again, the immediacy. So you're helping uh, teens and tweens learn to step back and, um, and, um, and also to react in, in uh, ways that, that are going to be more useful to them. I like that. I like that a lot. 
Um, I think there's probably a lot of folks out there that are going to be really excited to get their hands on this research. <laughs> um, we've got, we've definitely got one more question um, that I think would be great um, if you could address, um, both of you, Ellen and Erin. Um, Suzanne was asking about thoughts on kindergarten morphing into first grade and all of the academic pressure that comes with it. <clears throat> well, I'll start. Um, the Bezos Family Foundation and the Foundation for Child Development um, are in the process of creating a documentary that Kyle is actually um, one of the stars uh, is involved with. And um, we um, and we have filmed some very smart people um, and have um, looked at their their way of responding to the pandemic. And one of the major lessons from the pandemic, we look at the lessons from the pandemic, is to use a whole child approach, not just overemphasize academics, but use a whole child approach. Particularly important now, and parents are asking for this more than they have in the past are social emotional learning, which um, so that we're paying attention to how kids think, how kids feel and their social relationships, not just what they think. And um, it's, it's, you know, the, the problem for me with all of this is that you take any group of children and you, you could just look at seventh graders line up and you've got the tall ones and the short ones, you have the ones who have matured and you have the ones who haven't. And that's a metaphor for how development is. We think that all four-year-olds or five-year-olds should be kindergarten and exactly the same. They're gonna have that kind of diversity that you see physically in the seventh graders. We need to learn to, and this is another lesson from the film that we've made, to individualize. So we should not be having kindergarten uh, uh, become first grade. It's a very bad idea. We should be able to teach in ways that scaffold so that for the child who's ready for some first grade things, way cool, but the child who is normally doing the things that kindergartners or even younger children should do, uh, way cool too. We need that. We need to understand that development is diverse, and researchers are even latching onto this. They are arguing not for the high stakes test, but for ways that measure children against their own progress, because that's what development really is. Not you against all the hypothetical other people, the tyranny of the average, but against um, against yourself and your own growth. And if we could understand that diversity in development, it's not just neurodiversity, it's normal development is diverse, and we could respect it and not think that everyone should be exactly the same, then kindergartens should teach to the children who are in that kindergarten, but particularly now when there has been so much upheaval and, and for some families trauma in their lives. So if there's, if there's a pressure to, to do that, please, please try to remember the individual child and uh, and where that child, meet the child where that child is, as Aaron just put it. And That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Play is oh, go ahead, Aaron, please. Yeah. Well, we just, we need to just, and because we, we, we do this and everything is, but children learn through play. That's the best way for them to make all the connections. So um, getting too structured is not gonna propel their executive function in any way. Yeah, we always that say that executive right. function is is not you don't learn executive function by sitting in a chair. I said that I would come back to Megan McClellan, but she's developed some beautiful circle time games that promote executive function. And they're based on traditional children's games like Mother May I or um, th th those sorts of uh, uh, games. Um, um, so Simon Says is one of her executive function skill mm -hmm. games your head. Simon says, touch your toes. And you, the child has to remember the rules. In other words, working memory, think flexibly and not go on automatic. And that's a way that Megan McClellan, the one who did the adoption study and came up with attention span persistence, that's a way that she both measures executive function skills and teaches them. And you can take those games and use them for circle time. And that's one of the best ways to help children learn executive function skills. 
That's terrific. What a what a great way to wrap us up. Thank you so much. This is this has been amazing. I'm sure everybody on could sit here and probably talk to you all night long, but um, we have to be respectful of everybody's time. I would love to welcome Kyle back just to say a final farewell to folks, um, and I will just say thank you so much. We are so grateful for this partnership and really looking forward for um, to it launching. You're on, so Kyle. I'm on. So I just wanted to say uh, how grateful I am today, but how grateful I always am when I get to hear you, Ellen, and you, Aaron. I I feel like uh, canceling my dinner plans, and just because I want to listen more and more. Uh, uh, and I I also always fight inside my own head because I I can feel myself replaying scenes from raising my own kids and saying, did I do that right? Did I do that right? And but but the overwhelming feeling is the desire to get this out into every single educator's hands, into every single parent's hands, because that your guidance, it, it's profoundly important, not just to who our kids are when they're kids, but who our kids are when they're adults. So I, I, uh, I just, I'm so grateful to you and, and so excited about what is coming for us for our partnership. Now, I'm going to look down and read here because I want to make sure I say this correctly. Um, you can access these resources and a link to today's recorded webinar on the First Book website at our dedicated Skill Building Opportunity landing page. Uh, it's at firstbook.org backslash solutions, backslash skill building, and skill building is hyphenated. So that's a lengthy address. I don't know if we, uh, you know, we'll try to highlight it and send it out to people who have registered today. Uh, please, please, please help us get the message out on this. Uh, it, it's just critical. It's just critical and it's thrilling to be a part of it. So thank you guys, thanks both. And thanks to everyone who uh, joined us today. Thank you all so much. Have a good evening.